Please listen carefully. Hi, do you you boys and girls out there in podcast land? Making a movie costs time and money. Lots of it. And we indie filmmakers usually have little of either. So you have to be smart about how you use it. And to be honest, a lot of the times we make poor decisions with regards to the money part of that equation. Am I right or am I right? Well, Lens Pro to Go makes it easy for you to find the filmmaking and photography equipment you need for any project without breaking the bank by buying the latest and greatest Hoosie What's It or Thingamajiggy as soon as it makes its premiere at some trade show. And here's the best part. The people who work there are themselves working filmmakers and photographers. So they can answer any questions you have about gear as well as give you tips and suggestions. It's grade A customer service. And their prices include two-day shipping for all their items. So there's no shipping surprise cost when you get to the checkout page. Everything is shipped to you in Pelican cases with return address labels already printed and ready to go. So all you have to do is put the gear back in the original box, tape it up, slap on the label, then take it to your nearest UPS store or schedule a pickup. Sorry for your international folks, they are only available here in the U.S. Just head on over to LensProtogo.com and use the offer code RADIO to save yourself 10%. We thank LensProtogo for their support. All right, without further ado, on with the show. When I was an undergraduate at UC Berkeley, I was part of this co-ed business fraternity, Delta Sigma Pi. You heard me right, co-ed. In fact, even the girls were called brothers. Very odd. Anywho, every week we had the chapter business meetings, and every week I had something to say. Whatever the topic, Ron Dawson was sure to have an opinion about it. Do we really want to serve barbecue at the event? I mean, it can be so Yeah, I was messy. thinking that the flyers we've been putting up really haven't captured the essence of what the I think we should reach out about. to the big eight accounting firms and get them to what sponsor the event. What if we had the, the banquet at the restaurant in Emeryville instead of going all the way into the city? It Come on, everybody cheaper. is doing that. Let's do something different. I have some different. ideas of how we can increase our membership. Last we week just... I was reading the Wall Street Journal and they said that... Will there that... be a wide variety of music played at the event? Now, I was a newly initiated brother, and I guess I was just overzealous. And if you're a fan of this podcast, you probably know that I like to talk. So I guess, I don't know, I think I talk too much. So much so that the president of the chapter at the time pulled me aside one day and gave me a little constructive criticism. He said, I just want to say, Ron, that I think your enthusiasm and contribution to the chapter are great. They really are great. Your spirit is infectious, and I can tell you have a lot of great ideas. It's just that, well, some of the brothers have commented that you mm, talk a lot. Okay, what do you mean? I mean, it's not like me to sit and chit-chat in the back, you know what I mean? That's why I always like to sit at the front. No, it's not that you're talking to the people around you. It's that, well, you're raising your hand too much. It's like every single topic you have two or three things to say, and it can be a little mm, overwhelming. Now, we don't want you to stop contributing. Like I said, you have great ideas. Just dial it back a little. Give others a chance to share their ideas. And maybe not talk too long when you do share. And all I could say was, okay, sure, Prescott, thanks. About nine years ago, I was formally diagnosed with ADHD. Yeah, I'm sure some of you intuited that just from listening to this show. It's funny how I see the actions in my past through the lens of current diagnoses and discoveries. I have no doubt that what Prescott and other brothers witnessed were the uncontrolled actions of an overstimulated and excited ADHD type A business student. But I actually appreciated Prescott's feedback. Where others might have taken it personally and gotten pissy, For whatever reason, I took it in stride. I did some self-reflection and agreed that I could bring it down just a smidge. That was nearly 30 years ago, and to this day, that conversation echoes in my mind. 
Whenever I'm in a group setting and, and I feel my contributions becoming too dominating, I try to make a mental note to dial it back a bit. I actually think the way he handled it was pretty cool. He was friendly and encouraging, yet firm. He didn't pussyfoot around, he got to the point, but he did it in a way that validated me and my input. Prescott was quite the dude. Not surprisingly, he graduated magnum cum laude, and last I heard, he was like some billionaire tech VC. Feedback. Feedback on our work, our life, our relationships, has the power to elevate us as artists and human beings. I think constructive criticism and feedback are key ingredients and essential for the growth and success of any artist. Of course, artists tend to wear their hearts on their sleeves and are not always the best at receiving feedback. The good ones are though, and they realize that the way they look at their work is not always that objective, or rather, it's not objective as it should be. Getting valuable feedback from trusted friends and colleagues can, in a best case scenario, exponentially increase the effectiveness and execution of your art. In worst case, it will at least give you insight into why something may not be working. I'm sure the makers of the latest Pepsi ad could have used some feedback with that one. Well, today on the show, I open myself up again, and this time it's for the documentary I'm currently producing, Invisible Onus, a film about people living with chronic illnesses that don't manifest themselves visibly. We'll have part two of my interview with Vincent Vittorio of Life Is My Movie, a company that focuses on feature documentary production. You're going to hear some feedback from Vincent that has perhaps the most profound impact on the direction we've decided to take the film. A lot has happened since the last time we discussed this documentary, and you're about to find out. My name is Ron Dawson, and this is Radio Film School miniseries, Making a Documentary. On the last episode of Making a Documentary, I was speaking with Vincent Vittorio of Life is My Movie. So Life is My Movie Entertainment is a documentary studio that focuses on production and distribution. And so we're, we're unique in the fact that we don't necessarily need to sell our products to a distributor to move on because that's, um, that's 50% of our business is really making sure that we're um, working as a distributor with films that we're doing internally or co-productions, films that we come on in the middle of or just helping filmmakers from a consulting standpoint, or just straight distribution. Vincent is a fan of the show and reached out to me earlier this year after their first installment of Making a Documentary aired. We had a few calls, got to know one another, and have come to consider him a friend. On this call, we talked about the business and ethics of the current documentary landscape, which was the topic of the last Making a Documentary episode. The latter half of the call was his feedback on the crowdfunding video my wife and I made for our Kickstarter campaign. Here's a small clip from that video. Everything changes when you have an invisible illness. Everything. In October of 2011, Tazra Dawson was walking in a crosswalk when a car ran into her and threw her six feet into the air. The resulting injuries and medical treatments triggered a cascade of irreversible and chronic invisible illnesses. It wasn't right away that I thought, I want to make a film. Actually, it was never that I wanted to make a film. I'm, I don't see myself as a filmmaker. My husband is a filmmaker. I'm the photographer and the writer and the artist. But I felt like I was the only one dealing with this kind of thing, dealing with insurance and dealing with doctors and dealing with lawyers. And I wanted someone to somewhere tell me that this was going to be OK. And the person you heard at the top of that clip was my wife, who's the director of the film. You then heard me in the voiceover. Ironically, the version of the video that Vincent saw did not have this voiceover. What you heard me read in that voiceover was actually just text on a screen in the very first version. We changed it to a voiceover largely due to the feedback we got from Vincent about the text part feeling slow. Now, as I alluded to earlier, Vincent had some other great feedback which he graciously shared during my call with him. And I told him up front, feel free not to hold anything back. I guess to, to start off with 
the the film itself it's it's a great way that you're presenting it i i love that you know how you're able to really um let your your wife's story be kind of the backdrop to um taking you through the narrative my my biggest um things that were questions i wanted to ask you was first i, I feel like there would be an advantage to trying to have a a um a male character that is a potential survivor I think that would be a, a really good thing, unless there's something I overlooked. Is is there one currently? That is a great question and good observation. And no, it has been a somewhat challenge because every one of the survivors, and survivors is an odd term to use, but every one of the people who we're interviewing who is living with an invisible illness are women. So the only men in the, in the doc who we interviewed are the loved ones of people. So we have, you know, a couple of husbands, myself being one, and we have a son. And to my knowledge, those are the only males that we have in it. Um, but uh, it's definitely not without, you know, trying in terms of finding, you know, finding people. I mean, most of the people who we've interviewed are people that Tazra, my wife, who's directing the film, has been in contact with, you know, via her, her social media circles and Facebook and whatnot. Um, or personal friends, and so those have all been women. We're hoping that the the feedback and the stories of you know the few men we have can kind of represent that voice. But it would be great to be able to actually have uh, an interview with uh, with a man um, who is you know living with it. And so uh, I remember you we've talked before, and you talked about your friend who's who's kind of. Um, you know, suffered with it and, and lived with it. And so, you know, those kind of things come to mind. And, you know, one of the things we're hoping with the crowdfunding is to be able to, um, if, you know, if we're able to, you know, hit our goal using that money in order to get some of these additional stories. Because we've had people contact us in other states and whatnot. And so obviously constantly you go to these different places. So, yeah, so that's a great observation and it is definitely a challenge of ours. No, well, I, I think that's definitely something that you should should explore because I think it just makes it stronger. I think sometimes there's a lot of films that I felt like um, did a great job of presenting a story, but it was it was too narrow of a focus that wasn't allow uh, w wouldn't allow for them to to truly reach the audience that might benefit from seeing it. Right, right. Um, and um, it's also just uh, it's always good to try to find the balance when you can. Sure. Um, so that that was that was my my, my first you know uh, thought. Um, the other thing I, I was just wondering, and this is more of a, a question than, than a direction thing, is is your son? Are you feeling like your son's going to be a part of things with giving perspective as well, um, or is it just going to be more of like he's that you know very distant supporting character because he's um, a part of the family structure? That's a good question. Uh... There's two aspects to his participation and the role that he plays in the story. You know, a key part that he plays in the story is just the effect my wife's invisible illnesses have had on her relationship with him. So, and part of the interview, you know, she, her interview, she talks about, you know, before her accident, you know, she used to pick him up and swing him around and, you know, carry him. This is when he was, you know, he's 12 now at the time he was like five or six. So he, he was still small enough for her to do that. Mm -hmm. And then after the accident, she couldn't do that, you know? And so there's a part in an interview where she tears up because here's this mother who couldn't pick up her son anymore because of the pain that it caused. And so there's that aspect of how her relationship with her son changed because of that. And then there's the aspect of how her, her invisible illness affects him as a little boy and you know what he does in order to try to help her out and you know what it means to not be able to you know play with his mom the way he used to um and we have another woman an adult woman who we've interviewed who talks who's a daughter of an invisible onus um person living with invisible onus and so she kind of talks about from the perspective of an adult um uh, child uh, who has a parent living with it. So we kind of have two children perspectives because the movie is very much the stories of three types of people, the people living with it, the, their loved ones and the healers and 
um, and and the medical society that kind of treats them. And so, like, our son represents, obviously, the people living with it. So th- that's kind of like the role that he plays. Well, I think it would be good to, to try to explore that. Um, you know, going back to the example of what I said for having a male character, I think it, it makes it so strong if there was someone that, you know, is is also dealing with it. Because then you can find that, you know, from the the family element of things, you're seeing uh, a female, you know, the, the mother of the, the, the family that's helping to do that, because obviously that's a unique dynamic, um, you know, that the, 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 the woman plays in that role as being a mother. Yeah. And so to then have the person that, you know, depending upon how you look at it in families today, um, that role that the male plays as the father, um, having that weakness and having that thing that sometimes people can't understand. So, but I, I would explore that. I think that, you know, uh, children sometimes, um, when they're, they're the most, um, I don't know, like a million ways to put this. They're, they're just so real. Like the things Mm -hmm. that come out of the mouth, you know, I've got, I've got four little ones and I mean, they, they, you know, have no filter and they're so honest about everything. And sometimes if you like stop to like really like make sense of it, um, it, it can go so much deeper and, you know, it's, it's like, uh, it's, it's real profound. Sometimes the observations that they're able to make that I think would really, um, be powerful to, um, do something with this specifically because your wife is the, the, you know, the, the, the focus or not the focus, but like, just kind of like, you know, she's, she's making the film. She's a part of this process. So it'd be really good to hear that if, if it was something that, you know, you're, you're open to exploring. At 1.53 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time on April 6th of this year, our Kickstarter campaign ended. And regrettably, I report that we did not reach our goal. As it turns out, about 56% of Kickstarter campaigns fail, according to an article on Mashable. We learned a lot about our particular situation, namely that a lot of people in the chronic illness community just don't have extra funds. What disposable income they do have goes to either expensive medical treatment and insurance or meeting expensive dietary needs. And we can definitely attest to both. So what does that mean for our feature film? Well, that's a good question. For the answer to that, let's get back to my conversation with Vincent as he shares some interesting insight he gleaned recently on a trip to Sundance. Which actually, you know, leads me to another question and challenges and this is something that i've seen with documentaries in general is one making it feel like a narrative story um um as opposed to like one cohesive narrative story as opposed to like a bunch of little stories kind of sewn together um and i think that's something from a lot of many documentaries that i've seen uh sometimes that's hard to do particularly for topics like this where we can look at this as because we have so many different stories as like find the you know the best handful of stories and have say like six little vignettes that kind of obviously are all related to this greater topic or do we focus on one or two really key stories um but you know that idea of you know how do we go about weaving all these interviews together because there's so many different ways we could do it your thoughts on that, on, you know, making a documentary that is, you know, essentially a bunch of little stories woven together into a feature versus trying to focus on like maybe two or three at most core stories that are interconnected with one another. I'm going to respond to that first with a question. Sure, um, sure. What's got you set on a documentary and not a, a documentary series. Just curious. Uh, excellent question. Uh, well, to be honest, we're kind of leaning towards both in a sense that like when the feature is over, we have so many stories, we could do an ongoing series. Um, and we've kind of started releasing little vignettes leading up to the release where we've, you know, short one and a half to three minute videos, which are excerpts from interviews we've done. You know, some of them may be actual interviews in the film or some of them are just going to be like supplemental interviews so you know you know this is my wife's project this is her vision you know I would say her answer to that question is that um, she I think she feels like releasing a feature 
you know, gives it a certain sense of gravitas and credibility that this is an important topic that needs to be done versus, you know, just like, you know, a film series where, you know, maybe a bunch of people see the first episode and then the subsequent episodes, the, you know, the amount of viewership kind of goes down depending on it, you know, how popular it becomes, you know, versus like one big release of a movie of a feature length movie, which has, you know, the ability, let's say, to be released on a Netflix or a Hulu if it's, you know, if the quality's there uh, and kind of gets the eyeballs that maybe a an ongoing series wouldn't. Um, so. I no, th- no, that, that, yeah. that makes perfect sense. Let me let me jump right in there. It's sure. we're in an interesting time because the way that a lot of that is shifting. And I, I would like to point to like the jinx and making a murder and even, okay. you know, OJ made in America, which. If you haven't had a chance to see yet, it's oh, it's great. Um, oh, yeah, I've heard a lot of it. Can't wait. But it, it it's it's the format isn't as clean cut as like oh it must be this running time and it can only do this like that's changed. That was the television model, and the networks are no longer where people are going to to watch content. So you know, to your point of like the Netflix and Hulu thing, if you had something that was a documentary series or a standalone doc. I think both of those would be things that you could present to them and they would be examined, um, you know, similar for for the beginning and end. But looking at it being a multi-part series, um, but a multi-part series that isn't like, you know, let's have a host take us through something with a bunch of fluff that we're going to get into. But Mm -hmm. just think of the format of the feature link documentary, your beginning, middle and end, but broken up into three parts. It's. It's really we have, you know, this 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 flexibility now to really be creative with the way that we're telling these stories. And um, I think almost every conversation I had at Sundance this year was all about how the 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 series is is king and that's what everyone wants, you know, and, you know, that that could change over to something else, you know, in the near future. But right now that is what everybody's asking for because they think that it it can do something with breaking up the content into these multi parts to allow people to um you know uh, uh engage with it in a different way but i totally understand what you're saying as a documentary filmmaker there's something about kind of this like you know this one thing you can point to that accompanies ev- you know everything and it embodies the the lifeblood and the spirit of like what you wanted to do within the story so I, I, I could totally understand that, but it's just something worth thinking through. And I, I know you said that like past the documentary that the series would come. Um, and I have a lot of documentary filmmakers I work with as well as internally that we work with and we try to do that. Um, and the, the, the one struggle you get into is what makes it a series mm-hmm. compared to just like the added features that were like, you know, on the documentary that – you just instead of putting on the disc you're putting as extra features no that's a good point because uh, i mean i didn't even think about the whole series aspect of it and how you know you do see these you know documentary series coming out like the ones you mentioned and you know what distinguishes something like that versus um you know something that would be bonus features on a dvd you know you know i would say the kind of little vignettes we've been releasing uh, more along the lines of the bonus feature type um, scenario you know versus you know you know a series like that that would be uh suitable for like a hulu or a netflix would be you know something i would say at least uh four ideally six or more half hour or longer episodes that could go into more detail and you know, there's a huge part of the story that we're telling has to just do with the medical system and the problems in our medical system. I mean, you can do a whole documentary just on that. And, and you know, as we deal more and more with this with this issue, I can see that being a, a huge part of the series, like having, uh, you know, two or three episodes about our current medical system, like how it got to where it is today, you know, the idea of you know, the role that the insurance companies play, you know, the role of, you know, uh, doctors trying to get as many patients through the door as possible and competence. I mean, just recently we had a situation where my wife went in for, um, a mammogram and, uh, 
when you get a mammogram, you can have the ability to have what, what are called markers put in where they actually put something in the breast to, to make it easier for future uh, mammographers to find where yeah, a particular bullet lump was or whatnot. And uh, she has specifically said because her body um, does not take well to foreign objects, she has specifically said, like, do not put any markers in her body. And so she's had two. And so in this recent one that she had, the report came back that basically uh, referencing two markers, one in each breast. And we were like, and it freaked her out because she specifically said like she didn't want any. And so we knew right away this meant one of two things. Either previous mammographers had put a marker in when she specifically said no, or this report is wrong. It turned out that this particular part was wrong and, you know, they were working off of a template and they forgot to take that part of it out. And, and this is supposed to be like one of the top uh, places for, uh, you know, cancer specialists in our area. And so, like, what do you do when you're a person going to uh, you know, going to the medical system, going to a doctor and something like this happens? And it's like, how do you have trust in the system? And so we've had situations like that throughout her entire process. And that's a huge well, I don't want to say it's a huge part. It's a huge aspect of her story. You know, it contributes to why she even has diabetes because of the, you know, the steroid patches that they give her without telling her that there were steroid in these painkiller patches and the steroids created diabetes and all these other kind of things. And so I can see the series, a particular series, like just diving into that because it's such a big topic. It may be too much to try to put all in a documentary feature. Well, and, and that, that's where spinoffs are great. I mean, everyone right. wants evergreen content. And I think that when I look at this and I say, like, tragedy strikes, I'm I'm invested in the character. I'm invested in the person because I want to understand first what the tragedy is, how it's, you know, unfolding. And then kind of like through that, you're pulling back the veil. You're showing me the information of something like this. I mean, that example you just brought up there is what gets me totally excited about being a documentary filmmaker. Right. Because – you can bring that to people's eyes and get them to start asking questions. We have way, way too much trust in supposed experts. And I'm not trying to sound like a conspiracy theorist that's going to like go down the road, but we have to be more knowledgeable. I mean, you know, like like I was saying this actually this morning, I got audited by the IRS uh, a, a few years ago, um, well, last year, and I'm looking back at everything and I feel so stupid for trusting Mm. in these people and not being more aware of it. I mean, yeah. there's a level in which you need to take personal responsibility. It feels good to hand it off to someone and say, oh, tell me all the things you need to tell because you went to school for it, right. you know, all this classification. But I mean, as much as you want that, you, you gotta you gotta be aware of what's going on from medical procedures to like the way that you're living your life to your children's, you know, schooling. Like you, you have to be a part of everything in order to truly, um, you know, find that kind of middle ground. And so, um, to back, back to the point of the, the film with, um, the series, I think that would be if, um, you were going through that in which you were pulling back the veil step by step and you thought of it as, um, you know, episodes. And if it wasn't episodes and it was a feature length doc, um, you could also make it where that structure would be the points that you're, you're, you're hitting on of how you are trying to, show kind of the common myths or 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 give people a, a deeper understanding of maybe where they might have misconceived a, a particular thing based on, um, you know, common knowledge. But then you have the personal story that's going to connect them and then the experts to give, you know, a further explanation that the subject themselves can't because, you know, they're a part of it. They're a participant, but they're not um, truly uh, the, 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 the the knowledge to understand why or how or what's going on. Do you have like a gut answer to feature versus series when you think about the story we're telling? I mean, I, I'm, I'm partly uh, um, pushed based on all the, the, the people I'm talking with now looking for series content to say that. Um, but uh yeah, I, I would say series to me, this would be much more of a series to me. And I think it would allow for you to do a few things differently. One of the hardest things with the feature link doc format is you've got this moment, you know, halfway through or, you know, 
a, a third of the way through where where you just you don't you don't have the content or or maybe you have the content but you're thinking like how do I kind of split this up or lay it out to really like you know continue that emotional connection to it and it, it's hard I mean the same way that I think a short film is very a very hard format to do well and and with the feature you you always have that moment where it's like is it too long is it too short like people always say like what's I always love this question like what's what's the perfect time for a documentary and I'm like that's that's based on your content that's based on your story I mean I've seen docs that I think are too short and then docs I've seen that are too long that tackle different things I mean I remember seeing some that like you know went to the two hour mark but I never even felt like it was two hours because yeah. I was engaged they're pulling it back they're showing me the same way as this OJ one that I told you about it's I think it's only three episodes on on Hulu but it's five episodes on um, ESPN and I, I'm watching it with my wife and I'm just like, oh, my gosh, like this is an hour and 40 minutes we just watched for the first episode. Right, but right. I, I, I'm in it. You know, I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm in I'm invested in the character. I want to see how they're going to peel things back. But even in that circumstance, as I'm watching it as a creative myself, there's moments where I was like, yeah, that went on a little long or, you know, I, I would have cut this. I mean, I'm sure you as an artist as well. You're always looking at things um, with that eye as an editor um, or as, as as a creative that's thinking how can how can I you know make this move a little quicker a little stronger and with that being said I think that um, for this I really see this as as a series the producer in me says that because it's 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 what's hot now um, and I think it's um, also it it would allow you to compartmentalize um, some of the the things that you're going to go through and those other outside individual stories. And then the filmmaker in me says, I mean, a producer is a filmmaker, but I'm meaning more like the creative aspect of it, sure, less the sure. business side. This, this really just seems like it would be a really good story and it would allow for you to possibly do more with it because, you know, I'm investing in somebody that is a part of this. Her motivation is based on her own personal experiences and through her um, motivation, she's going to bring me to to pull back that veil to, um, you know, really help me understand it better. Yeah. And that to me is something I would invest in. And you really could go so far with it. I mean, just like you said, I mean, I have I have another friend I went to grad school with that just contacted me a few weeks ago. And um, she gave me this whole conspiracy theory thing that she stopped taking, you know, these meds and stopped doing uh, um, the blood transfusion thing. And like she literally is better. And she's like, have I been lied to this whole time? Is it, is it this big corporation, like, you know, trying to feed me it because of this? And, right. you know, I don't know enough about that, but there's so many of those things that you could uncover with this. If like, if we went that route, would it be best to essentially have the entire series done in the can and edit it before like trying to take it around? Or is the kind of thing where you just kind of release it, kind of like drip release it as it comes out and then... In the process of doing that, you also try to find like a distributor. Does that make sense? Like, is it better to have it all done, um, have it all said and done and say, okay, here we have this six episode series and we're trying to pitch it to these different places versus we started this series episodes one and two already up and we're still working on episodes, you know, three through six. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that makes sense. I mean, we're dealing with that with actually the the sequel to uh, the project um, on prison reform. We're we're going through cases that are people that were wrongly convicted, um, and uh, we're kind of tackling that. Like, do we create the full piece um, where it's going to be the first season in, in in you know in theory, or do we do just the pilot and push it off? I think your circumstance is a little different, where you know there's no real reason at all to do anything. With pilot with this. I mean, I think you've already shot enough content and you have enough stories that is, is worthy of something bigger. I think it's more of a creative, um, I guess, uh, you know, like, like bringing the minds together to think like how to lay this out a little differently. And I think that the same thing that you're imagining for the feature length doc should be just broken up like that. Mm -hmm. When you present it to someone, it's a doc series. Right. That goes through how many episodes that it would would warrant based on the content you have, and you put a you put a, a cap on it. I mean, the 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 trouble is when we say documentary or when we say series, mm -hmm. we're immediately thinking, or you know, I am at least um, that that real cheese stuff, you know, where it's like a host or like you know, like like one of those like like uh, 
check out my house shows or something like, you know, it's right. like, that's, that's not the format in the documentary series format. It's, it's, if anything, it's just finding those endpoints that allow you to have more content and have, um, those, those mini arcs that isn't a thread in the tapestry of putting all these little stories together that, you know, can't stand alone on their own. And I think that the way that you can really hold that together is by making it very clear at the beginning mm -hmm. um, the quest that she is on. And then from that, she's going to uncover things through the process with the hopes at the very end that you're going to have a conclusion of responding to what was learned to kind of, you know, um, recap everything that's there. Right. And less like, oh, every episode, hey, it's me again. Do you remember what happened? You know I mean, like, that's not that's not the format. Great. Thanks a lot, Vincent. <laughs> You've just now giving us more challenges to think about. <laughs> I hope you're satisfied with yourself. <laughs> no, 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 those are good points. Um, definitely worth the conversation having uh, worth having. Um, I mean, so with that mindset, like, would we I mean, I don't know what you thought about the crowdfunding video or if you had any feedback on that. Like, I don't think it would require like redoing the entire video, but obviously parts of it we would need to redo if we were to go the series route. Um, uh, oh, yeah. I, I don't think you'd have to do too much with that. I mean, it's literally just a terminology thing, too. You true. know, I mean, a lot of people that aren't in the space, they wouldn't even know what the difference is between any of those things. <laughs> right. you know? That's true. It's like, oh, you're going to be on the video. You know, I love when older people say like, oh, you're, you're doing a video, you know, and right. You're like, no, no, it's it's a movie. Oh, yeah, a video movie. Okay. And you know, but um no, I, I think um to your uh your 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 crowdfunding video, I thought um, you know, you, you did a pretty good job of um laying out kind of what you've done and why this is important. And um I I guess all of my feedback is very micro stuff where sure. um I can go in there but um and, and make notes with time code stuff, but the the big broad things that I would suggest is um, when she talks about her accident, you use text as a device to do that. And I think that text is sometimes uh, hard to kind of have that like lull, that moment where it like slows things down that I feel like you could take it in many different ways. You can make it where the text that's explaining things is over um, her responding to things so you kind of have that like duality of like she's going down um you know the road she goes down when she says that you know the impact that it's had mm -hmm. um while you're reading about the story like uncovering it so you're condensing it right you could also do something where you interject you you in the film and you're in the kickstarter and you're explaining that to tell the story because sometimes mm -hmm. it's it's uh it's it's better when you have someone else um painting the picture right, right. or you Further, if you went that route of what I was, you know, mentioning earlier for your, um, uh, your son, um, which, how old is your son? 12. 12. Okay, cool, cool. I was like the frame of reference. My, my oldest will be 11 this year. So you can immediately put yourself in that space and be like, okay, okay. I know how old your son is. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I think that like he could be a great, um, person to, to assist with in that space as well. Um, and I think it would allow for a more kind of personal connection to it. Outside of that, I think everything else was just little things that I would point out like, hey, you might want to do this here or move this over, which isn't really mentioned, you know, we're talking through here. Sure, um, sure. But that's the only big, big thing that stood out to me. No, that's good. That's good. Uh, I was just watching uh, some crowdfunding videos yesterday for filmmakers. And that's, uh, you know, one thing that other films where there was multiple filmmakers, you know, they'd have. You know, if there were two people, they had both of them on versus, versus just the director. They have the director and the producer would come on and give some commentary. So, no, that's helpful. That, that's helpful. I appreciate it. Yeah, we, uh, we did that with ours. Uh, Asher and I um, uh, did that with the one we uh, did for the warehouse, the mm -hmm. refugee project. And, you know, I this is our first, like, on our own type, you know, crowdfunding thing. And I, I got to tell you, it's... Uh, it's, 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 it's a lot of time. I mean, I think it's hard to put yourself out there yeah. and ask people. And I, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't envy people that play in this space too often because I'd, I'd rather just, you know, be able to make uh, important stories without having to kind of feel like you're holding that cup out there for everyone. But it's an important thing when people engage and it's also about building an audience that understands what, you know, you're trying to do. I think that that sometimes is, is even more valuable than whatever you're getting in a Kickstarter or, 
Indiegogo or whatever you know you're using. So Tazra and I have decided to transform Invisible Onus from a feature documentary into a short film series. We're calling it the Invisible Onus Film Project. And minimally, it will be comprised of three 10, 20 minute short films, one focusing on people who have an invisible illness, one focusing on loved ones, and one focusing on healers in the medical community. We'll also have some bonus content like extended interviews. And I must say, I am encouraged. I actually think in the long run, a short film series may reach a larger audience than if we had done a feature. In fact, when I spoke to JD and Alanda about their feedback, JD made this suggestion. Honestly, I think that you guys should take this to uh, the Vice Network. Because it seems to me it's like mm-hmm. right up their alley, more than Netflix and all those other places. Oh, interesting. There's a show that's going to tell you to, yeah, Vice. Yeah, no, I'm familiar you with know, Vice, yeah. yeah. Yeah, like there's a show that I watched called Weed a Kid. It's a great show, and it's very similar in a lot of ways to what I think you guys are doing. Like the, um, Krishna is the, what, the main host. He kind of reminds me of you. You know, a guy will come in or talk, whatever. You guys go in and you talk to people. Like like one episode might be about vets that are dealing with PSD, uh, PTSD. Um, PTSD. Right. With um, but they use, they're using marijuana to medicate. What you guys are doing is kind of similar in that I can see this invisible illness tap into because you listed all those different illnesses on your page. Right. And I can see you guys having a really great documentary about all this stuff. But I think you should also be planning concurrently if you can, as best you can. To go to a network like Vice or whatever while you're doing this because I, I really think that a show like this would be great on that. I think people would love this show. And I almost feel like doing a, just a documentary or just looking at as a documentary is almost a disservice hmm. only because it's so limited in scope. Right. It's almost, I know you guys are already kind of thinking ahead with your stretch goals, but yeah. You know, stretch them even now. I mean, go, go I mean, I would, because you might get funding from Vice to do this. I mean, because they shoot, like, what you guys are shooting, like, when you watch Weed Kit, it's very similar to your style of shooting. It's, you know, handheld, he goes in, but it's very pertinent information, very interesting stuff, and I think you guys are, are right there. Making a documentary, feature length or short film, is challenging. I learned that lesson last year during the making of my short film, Mix in America the making of which I also shared on this podcast. And one of the hardest parts about it is making it visually interesting when all you have are head and shoulder interviews. Also, working with your spouse has a whole set of problems that honestly could be a documentary unto itself. These and more issues will be addressed and discussed on future episodes of our mini-series, Making a Documentary. So be sure to stay tuned. Radio Film School is a production of Dare Dreamer Media and is a proud member of the Podcastica Network, a small collection of pop culture podcasts that covers topics from your favorite television shows to meditation and health to podcast production. This and other great shows can be found at podcastica.com. Music for this episode was curated from freemusicarchive.org. Links to tracks are in the show notes. Huge thanks to Lens Pro to Go for sponsoring the show. If you live in the United States and you need equipment for a photo or video shoot, look no further than our friends at LensProToGo.com. If you want top-notch customer service from working filmmakers and photographers, then this is the place to go. Everything is shipped in Pelican cases, two-day shipping costs are included in the rates, and if you use the offer code RADIO, you'll save yourself 10%. So you're helping the show and you're getting a good deal. It's a win-win. That's LensProToGo.com. Giving them your business is a wonderful way to support the show. Another way you can support us is by hopping over to iTunes and leaving us a rating and review. You can always get the show also on Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or use our RSS feed to use whichever podcatcher you prefer. You can follow me on Twitter at DareDreamerRon, where I curate links and stories about filmmaking, photography, social media, and marketing and branding. Let me know if there's a documentary you're working on and what kinds of lessons you've learned in the making of it. If you just want to stay notified with what's up on the show, follow us at Radio Film School. That's it for this week. Remember, if the story sucks, I don't care what you shot it with or cut it on. See you next time.
You're listening to Dare Dreamer FM, the sound of creative expression. Hmm? Ah! Hmm. Oh.